Folks, I cannot put into words what Jesus did on the cross for us. The beating that He took. And when you think about Jesus, He was born in a manger. And really, He was born to die for your sins and I. And I thank God that He went through with it. I know in the Garden of Gethsemane, some people say He had a weak moment, but I don't think so at all, folks. He had come to do the will of His heavenly Father. And He died. He was crucified. You have to understand, the cross, folks, was a cruel death instrument. They literally drove spikes into His hands and drove spikes into His feet. And even towards the end, and this is a statement I will never forget, the first time I read it in the Word of God, it just captured me. And he said this, with his hands nailed to a cross, with his feet bleeding down, with a thorn, thorns, uh, you know, a crown of thorns on his head and blood running from his face, here's what he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Every sin you've ever committed can be forgiven by our Heavenly Father because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross. And folks, we're here today to celebrate, yes, His birth, yes, His life, but today we're celebrating His resurrection. He is alive. He is alive and He is risen. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Matthew chapter 28. Matthew 28. I want you to see three things today in Scripture. He is risen. Number one, the word of an angel. I think it'd be cool for some angel just to talk to me. Wouldn't that be a cool thing? I really do. The second thing, the word of an eyewitness. In a court of law, you need two eyewitnesses. And do you know what happened? You'll see this in just a minute. There were two Marys, the first ones, to see Jesus Christ. You notice things in Scripture, and they stand out in Scripture. It was the women, these two women and a few others, that followed Joseph of Arimathea to the tomb so they would know where the tomb was. So there was no doubt, because there were a lot of lies flying around about what happened to Jesus. But I'm telling you, He rose from the dead. And the third thing I want you to see, not only the word of an eyewitness, but the word of Jesus Christ himself. Let's start in Matthew 27, verse 62. On the next day, which followed the day of preparation, and again, folks, there were somewhere between a million and a million half people in uh, Jerusalem because of the Passover. The chief priests and the Pharisees gathered together to Pilate saying, Sir, we remember while he was still alive how that deceiver said after three days, I will rise again. They just basically calling Jesus a liar. Therefore command that the tomb be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away. And, And again, folks, they just came up with this idea They were just thinking, what is something that we can say? Because they were afraid. They saw Jesus' miracles. They knew what he had done. They knew his power and uh, that God had given them. And so they had fear in their hearts that the very thing that Jesus said would happen would happen. He would steal them away and say to the people, he has risen from the dead. So the last deception will be worse than the first. Pilate said unto him, you have a guard. You'll have to understand what a guard means. It was a group of 16 Roman soldiers. They watched the tomb four at a time, those three days around the clock. Nobody came in and out. Nobody passed that tomb unless you saw these soldiers. And if for some reason they fell asleep, and that tomb was open, they would have to be uh, executed. So they are staying awake. They are guarding. There's four of them, and it was some of the finest soldiers in that 
army. So he wanted to make sure Pilate, no one was getting in. Go your way and make it secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure, sealing the stone and setting the guard. And you know what's the funny and the irony of it all? They made it what they thought nobody can get in. But I got news for you folks. My God can do anything. My Jesus can do anything. Folks, we know even after he arose, he walked through walls, folks. He was Jesus. He could do whatever he wanted. He walked on the sea. Think about that. And then we get to chapter 28. The word of an angel. Now after the Sabbath, and again the Sabbath, the Jewish Sabbath was on a Saturday. As the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. And the other Mary was James and John's mother. And the Bible says, and behold, there was a great earthquake. Oh, that that, that was a coincidence. Are you kidding me? Folks, God can make things happen. Mary and Mary were on their way to the tomb. They were not there when this earthquake happened, but they felt the earthquake on the way, I'm sure. For an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone of the door and sat on it. Folks, it would take, they said anywhere between six to eight Roman soldiers to move the stone to seal it. And when we say seal it, they put a pilot seal. There was a seal on there that, that no one was to break. And if you broke that seal, you also could be put to death. And so you look up and you see what is going on and you see an angel. And folks, God sends angels as messengers. There was a message God wanted to deliver that day, that day. And look at verse 3, and his countenance was like lightning. Folks, he glowed. This angel lit up and his clothing was white as snow. It reminds me of Jesus in, in the, the Mount of Transfiguration. You looked at him and you were thinking, is this, is this real? Is this a ghost? Is, is this? You're not sure. And it says, and the guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. Romans, finest, because of the earthquake, because they are seeing something they have never seen before. They shook. They probably fell down on the ground from the earthquake and had fear in their hearts. But the angel answered and said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He is risen. As he said, come and see the place where the Lord lay. So the angel makes the first announcement. He's not here. Folks, Jesus told the disciples four times in the book of Matthew, I am going to die. I am going to die on a cross, but I will rise again. Look in Matthew chapter 20. Matthew 20, verse 17. Now Jesus, going up to Jerusalem, took the twelve disciples aside on the road and said to them, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priest and to the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him to the Gentiles and mock and scourge to crucify. And the third day he will rise again. So it wasn't like Jesus had not told them but it just wasn't seeking, uh, you know, sinking into them. Why? Because they didn't go to the tomb. Mary, the two Marys went to the tomb to anoint the body and to uh, finish anointing the body. But still in their own minds, the disciples stayed back saying, oh, all is lost. Jesus has died. We thought he was going to take over the Roman government. We thought he was going to rule from Jerusalem, but he didn't. And they, they just almost had lost hope. And they had forgotten what Jesus has said. And Jesus' own words in John chapter 11, Lazarus had died. He had called, Mary and Martha had called and said, you need to come 
uh, your friend, your buddy, how he, is, he is sick unto death. But Jesus tarried three days. And think about that. Think about what he said. And matter of fact, look in verse 20. Now Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him, but Mary was sitting in the house. She had an attitude, folks. Now Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. What was he saying? Jesus, it's your fault. If you would have come, if you would have come, he would have lived. But even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. And Jesus said unto her, your brother will rise again. And Martha said unto him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection of the last day. She's talking about the rapture of the church. In verse 25, Jesus said unto her, and and I'm telling you, here is the, the summation of why Jesus was here. I am the resurrection, Jesus said. I am the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. Oh, folks, that's the greatest news that you'll ever hear. That is the greatest news, that if you know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, you will not die that second death. You will live forever. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? And she said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God who has come into the world. Oh, folks, Jesus can do anything he chooses to do. But Jesus tarried because which would be the greater miracle? Folks, this was the greatest miracle Jesus did while he was on earth. He could have came early. He could have healed him from a distance. He had done that before. But he wanted to go because he had already been there. And earlier, and and, and in this text, it said, you know, roll back the stone. And Mary said, oh, no, don't do that. He stinketh. Four days. And folks, when I think about that, I think about Jesus' words. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one come to the Father except by me. Jesus was showing power over death. So we see the word of an angel. Now look at verse 7. And go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And indeed, he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. So the first thing we see is we see the word of an angel. Don't you remember the days? I remember my days days where my father, and especially my grandfather, when they said something, you could take their word to the bank. They bought houses. They bought land on a handshake. And folks, I am telling you, God's never lied to anybody. You can take it to the bank. Jesus is alive. He is alive. He is living today. He is living inside of us. The word of an angel. Now let's look at the word of eyewitnesses. Look at verse 8. So they went out quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to bring his disciples' word. They didn't walk, folks. They ran. They had fear of talking to this angel and realizing what had been going on. There was great joy. God chose two ladies, Mary and Mary Magdalene, to bring the first witness, the first eyewitness that Jesus was not in the grave. And it says to bring... uh, his word to his disciples. And verse 9, And as they went to tell the disciples, behold, Jesus met them saying, Rejoice. It's good enough. I would take an angel's word for it. Wouldn't you take an angel's word for it? If an angel literally came to you and said, This is what happened. But they got something even better than the word of an angel. Jesus Christ himself stopped the two Marys. 
and said, rejoice. Oh, folks, we have reason to rejoice today. You look at this world, man. It has gone crazy, folks. So much hate, so much dying, so many things going on. But I'm telling you, death cannot affect a Christian. The Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And so Jesus, they saw him the last time on a cross. They saw a Joseph of Arimathea taking his limp, dead, bloody body down. And now they're looking at him, and he literally says, Rejoice! I'm not dead. I am alive. So they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. Folks, two things that we should do, even as Christians. Why would they grab his feet? Think about it. They didn't want him to go. They had missed him for three days. They had probably doubts in their own mind. Let me tell you something, folks. God has never let you down. God has never lied to you. He loved you so much, he allowed his son his only son, to be crucified on a cross. And Mary and Mary just dove at his feet saying, oh, Master, don't go. Don't go. And worshiped him. You've done a great thing on Easter Sunday. You have come to worship our Lord and Savior. You have come to thank our Lord and Savior You have come to be witness that you believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Then verse 10 says, Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. There was still fear in their eyes. There was still not doubt, but just saying, Is this real? Am I dreaming this? Is this real? And Jesus said, Go and tell my brethren to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. So the very same thing he told The angel told them, Jesus said it also. And these two Marys were eyewitnesses, the first ones to see Jesus alive. Now look at verse 11. Now while they were going, behold, some of the guard came into the city and reported to the chief priest all things that had happened. And by the way, folks, wherever God is working, I'm telling you, Satan is right behind. He's here, folks. He's the prince and power of the air. He hates God. He hates Jesus. He wants to take you to hell with him. But I'm telling you, there is no one more powerful than God. Verse 12, then they assembled with the elders and consulted together. They gave large sums of money to the soldiers. Hey, what did they do? They knew mankind. They knew human human folks. Let's just bribe them. Let's just give him a lot of money, not some money. And folks, it was hush money. It was hush money saying, tell them his disciples came at night and stole him while while away, while we slept. And And if this comes to the governor's ear, we will appease him and make you secure. You lie for us, we'll save your life. In the the deal about being stolen away, Think about this, folks. If they had really stolen it, would they have not taken him in the cloth or in, in, in the cloth and all that he had on? I mean, if you're going in and you're trying to get in there and you're trying to get out as quick as you can, you're just grabbing the body, you're taking the, the, the burial cloth and everything with you. But yet, the Bible says it was laying perfectly where he lay. And folks, the earthquake, if you think about it, it wasn't to let people out. Jesus was already out of the tomb at that time. It was so people could come in and be an eyewitness to he is alive. There are so many things the world lies about. They lie about even the money issue. Money is not the most important thing in the world. And I understand you need money to live, and it takes money to live. But the most important thing is knowing Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. And the future all is in His hands. Verse 15, 
So they took the money and did as they were instructed and th- did as they were instructed. This saying is commonly reported among the Jews from this day. Look at 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15. Paul is speaking here to the church at Corinth. And look what he says. Folks, this is the gospel. When someone says the word gospel, he's talking about the good news. I've had some good news in my life, folks. I've had some great news in my life. But nothing compares to the good news of Jesus Christ, the gospel. Moreover, brethren, I've declared to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received in which you stand, by which you are saved if you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believe in vain. Folks, saved means Jesus Christ is Lord of your life. Saved means you've turned all and turned all over to Christ and you've been asked, you've asked forgiven of your sins. Saved is knowing Jesus Christ, praying the sinner's prayer. Verse 3, for I delivered to you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He rose again the third day according to Scriptures, and that He was seen by Cephas, who is Peter, and by the twelve. After that, He was seen by over 500 at once. All you need is two eyewitnesses that happened that day. Then in the 40 days between uh, his death and, and, and his going up into heaven, his ascension, over 500 people saw Jesus alive. Folks, I'm telling you, he is alive. Verse 7, after that he was seen by James, then by the apostles, Then last of all, he was seen by me also as one born out of due time. When did Paul? Paul wasn't an apostle. It was after the day of Pentecost. But when did Paul see Jesus? On the road to Damascus. God blinded him. He was a Christian persecutor. He was at the feet of Stephen. The the clothes of Stephen was at his feet. He Uh, arrested Christians for a living. But God, in His sovereignty, went hunting Saul, who later became Paul. And he, uh, He accepted Jesus Christ into His life. Ananias led Him to the Lord. And He is now testifying on what Jesus has done. And look at this. And after that, he was seen by over 500 at once, whom greater part remained to the present, but some have fallen asleep. After that, he was seen by James and the apostles. Then last of all, he was seen by me me also as one born out of due time. Folks, he was an apostle of Jesus Christ. So we see the word of an angel. We see the word of an eyewitness which was, again, Mary and Mary. And the third thing and final, the word of Jesus Christ himself. Folks, last words are important. If you are at the bed of someone dying, I am telling you their last words are very important. And this last point is where Jesus gave his disciples an assignment. He said, hey, I told you before I'm going to die. I told you I can't be here forever. And his ministry was just three years old. But he invested in the life of the disciples. He knew that the church in the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 was going to start. He knew that there needed to be leaders in this church and people who were not afraid to share the gospel with others around them. So the Bible says the third thing, the word of Jesus Christ. Then the 11 disciples went away into Galilee and to the mountain in which Jesus had appointed for them. And they saw him and they worshiped him, but some doubted. Have you noticed everywhere we've seen, it was like Thomas. Thomas was not with them when Jesus was with the disciples the first time. 
And he literally said, if I don't see the nails and the scars in his hands or the scars in his side, I don't believe. They would not take the word of other disciples of Peter and John and some that had saw him. And even seeing Jesus in person, okay, in person, some doubted. Then verse 18, and Jesus came and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. What is he saying? God sent me down here. I've finished my assignment. He's given me authority. Folks, even the winds and the waves obeyed his voice. And what is he saying? He's saying that authority that God has given me, I am transferring it to you. You are responsible from now on. It's your job to tell other people about me. You are to, look at the first word in verse 19, go, go. That means outside the four walls of our church. That means witnessing where you are. Do you not realize that people watch you everywhere you go? They see where you go. They, they listen to what you say. Do you realize you preach a sermon every day and you don't even have to use words? People are watching you. You are a Christian. You should uphold the name of Jesus Christ. So the first thing he tells them is to go. And then he tells them to do three things and make disciples. Make disciples, folks. That's new Christians. We need to learn the Roman road. We need to learn the gospel. We need to be able to take out our Bibles and walk through the gospel with people. It's there. The Roman road, Gideon Bibles have it in there. Scott, two or three times a year, does witnessing without fear. So it says, go and make disciples of all nations. Folks, that's all, all people, all colors, all everything. You think of what God has done, brought so many people uh, into Fort Smith, so many kinds of people. And folks, everyone, everywhere needs Jesus Christ. Then he says, baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit. Why baptism? It doesn't save you. It's simply saying, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's saying that I invited Jesus into my life and I testify when you walk through the baptismal waters, when we bury you in Christ and raise to walk into the newness of life, you're telling everybody out here, you're telling your family, you're telling the people you work with, you're telling the church body that you align with Jesus Christ, that you love him and you want to be baptized. And then the third thing, is teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. Why do we have Sunday school? Because we teach the Word of God. Why do I teach the book of James on Sunday night? Because we're teaching the Word of God. Why do we have Wednesday night service? Because we're teaching the Word of God. It's one thing for people to get saved, but it's another for us to disciple. I'm telling you, when we first started talking about a new sanctuary, we started looking at cost and we started just, just praying about what God want us, wanted us to do. And I am telling you, God had told me, I mean, just flat out, we were already doing two services. We'd been doing that for five years. And that last Easter Sunday, people had to leave. We did two services in the old sanctuary. And in a couple, I, I was told by ushers, had to go because there was no place for them to sit. And that's, folks, why we are here in this place. Because the work of God, it's not us. It's not Steve and I. It's everyone. It takes all of us. And we just want to bring more people into God's family. We want to give God the glory for everything that He has done. We can't do it. God can. He brings the increase. And in teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you. And I love this. And lo, I am with you always. You know what always is? It is forever. That commitment you made to Jesus Christ, 
it is forever. Oh, I know sometimes we backslide. Folks, I have backslid. I have done things wrong that would not make Jesus proud. But God forgives. God forgives. And I'm telling you, He is waiting with open arms. Sometimes all we need to do is to rededicate our life to Jesus Christ. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. In closing, what proof do we have of the resurrection? Well, folks, we have the Trinity. Have you noticed in what we read and in the Great Commission, we call it is the, is the God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit? It's right there, folks. Number one, they were convinced by an angel of God. God helped convince them. Number two, they were confirmed by Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, literally, His literal appearance said, hey, I'm alive. I'm alive. And number three, they were commissioned by the Holy Spirit. He said, and lo, I am with you also. Disciples, go out and win people to Jesus Christ. What does the resurrection of Jesus Christ prove? i got six things here. It proves that Jesus was the Son of God. It proves that He is who He says He is. It verifies the truth in Scripture. Folks, we believe the Bible. It is yes, it is amen. It is truth. It assures us of our own resurrection. We will rise again. Number four, it gives us power for holy Christian living. We can do it. With God's help, we can do it. Number five, it gives us the authority to be a bold witness for Christ. We just spoke of that. Number six, it shows God's power over death. So my question today, as we close, do you know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? If you were to die today, would you go to heaven? Oh, folks, the answer is not, I hope so. You need to know. Would you bow your heads? Ever head bowed and ever eye closed. I want to ask you, do you know, are you 100% sure that if you were to die, you would go to heaven? Folks, I'm telling you, there would be no greater day in your life than today to receive Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. The Holy Spirit right now is dealing with you. It's dealing with you. It's saying, hey, you don't know. You aren't sure. So would you make sure? Would you make sure the Bible is real, folks? I am, I am representing God Himself. I have read to you from Scripture, inspired, holy Scripture, and the greatest decision you'll ever make. I waited 22 years to make that decision. And it was the greatest decision I've ever made in my life. And today, on Easter Sunday, you can accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You say, Mike, what do we, what do, we do? Just tell me what I need to do. Number one, you need to repent of your sins. Repent of your sins. You need to ask for forgiveness of your sins. You need to believe that Jesus was the Son of God. You need to believe that He died, and three days later, He arose. And you need to give Him your whole life, not part of you, not some of you. You need to totally surrender. Here I am, Lord. Here I am. I can't do it without you. If you're here today and you want to do that, I'm going to pray a prayer out loud. I'm going to pray it out loud, and you just pray it to yourself. If you truly don't know, if you truly want to be saved today, you pray this prayer to yourself. I'll pray it out loud. Our Heavenly Father, just pray it to yourself. Our Heavenly Father, I know I'm a sinner. God, I'm so sorry for my sins. God, please forgive me of my sins. God, I believe that Jesus was the Son of God. 
I believe he was born of a virgin. I believe he lived 33 years perfect here on earth. I believe he died on a cross. But I also believe three days later, he arose. And God, I ask you to come into my life. God, I ask you to be my boss. God, I know you are real. I've seen you work, and God, I'm, I'm giving you my life. I totally surrender to you. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for listening to me. I love you, God. In Jesus' name I pray. And before we open our eyes, if you are here today, I'm not going to come out to you. I am not going to uh, publicly come to you. But if you prayed that prayer and you want to just testify to God, a testimony of God, would you just lift your hand up and say, Brother Mike, I prayed that prayer with you. I have prayed that prayer with you. Would you just raise your hand? Don't be ashamed. Are there any here? Any that have prayed that prayer? Yes, thank you. Just hold your hand up for a second. Yes, thank you. Yes, thank you. Someone else, just for a second. God, I thank you for those who raised their hands. God, I thank you that their name was written in the Lamb's book of life. And God, I pray that you would just give them the faith and the courage to come and make their decision public. God, we love you. We thank you. I pray for the Christian. God, maybe some need to rededicate their life to Christ. I pray for some that may need to follow the Lord in baptism or even join the church today. God, we lift those folks up to you. God, this is your invitation. This is your time. And God, we give you the credit. We love you. We praise you. We worship you this day. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Would you stand to your feet? If God has spoken to you in any way, you come. Don't wait on somebody else. You come.